chapter 28 of Exodus, uh, as we start, uh, we're going to be traveling a little bit this morning, so, uh, have your finger here, <laughs> uh, just because I think it's important and, uh, I, I think it's, uh, just putting all of it together for us. So it says in verse one, and take thou unto thee Aaron, thy brother. So we've gone through the tabernacle. We, we've gone through the whole area, uh, that, that, uh, uh, the Lord had talked about, uh, in the chapters there. And we'll talk about it again as we go through. And when we get to Exodus, we'll see even more of it again. Uh, but it says, take thou unto thee Aaron, thy brother and his sons with him from among the children of Israel, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office, even Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and Eleazar and Ithamar, Aaron's sons. And thou shalt make holy garments for Aaron thy brother, for glory and for beauty. And thou shalt speak unto all that are wise-hearted, whom I have filled with the spirit of wisdom, that they may make Aaron's garments to consecrate him or set him apart, that he may minister unto me in the priest's office. And two times in these first three verses, we see an interesting statement. You would think uh, differently, uh, but because of God's word, we we know the truth. Uh, but it says twice in these first three verses that they can minister not to the people, but to God. And that is so important. We don't minister to people. We minister to God. Uh, We have an audience of one that we want to be faithful to, that we want to minister to. And in everything that we do, it it is not for our glory. It is not for anybody else's glory. It's for God's glory. And so as we minister in his way, with his spirit, with his teaching, then we see that we're ministering to him. And he calls us a kingdom of kings and priests. And we're here not to minister to people. We're here to minister to God. As a result of ministering to him, we are going to minister to people. That's that's a given. That That's a result of our relationship with the Lord is that we're going to minister to people. But the first and foremost place that we minister is to our Lord. With our hearts right, with our, our mindset right, with all those things in place and in order. And again, we see the order of God. We see his, his righteousness, his truth. And the order in the patterns that we see here in these scriptures reveal so much to us about the things that are to come. Because remember, this whole book is given by inspiration of God. It's all his word. He's the one that's that's brought it to the people that are writing it down. But in the midst of it, he, he says, I want you to minister to God first. That's the whole purpose of the tabernacle, the whole purpose of our lives, walking with him and entering into those holy places, is that we would minister to God. And it's a privilege, it's an opportunity, but what a blessing it is as we do it in the right way. Uh, Because we can minister in the wrong way, and we see the results of it, that they bring nothing to us. There's no profit, there's no benefit. But as we minister to the Lord, it always enriches us. Maybe not financially, But he's not into the finances that much. He's he's into blessing. And he's into the riches that he has for us. The the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the kindness, the temperance. I know all of you love the patience. Most of you drop it off the fruit of the Spirit. Everything else is there, but no patience. (laughs) Uh, But he's there even for that, too, because he had patience with us, didn't he? (laughs) And long-suffering and waiting for us to come. Uh, But he says, take Aaron your brother and his sons with you, uh, that they may minister in the priest's office. That this, he was, Aaron was going to become this high priest, this one who was going to minister in that place. And if you notice too, we've got four sons here, Nabab, Nadab and Abihu, Eleazar and Ithamar. We're going to see later on all of these guys, uh, but two of them were going to get smoked. Because they did things in the wrong way, with the wrong heart, for the wrong results. And we see the danger of walking in the wrong way. That it it will kill us. Maybe not physically, but certainly spiritually. Uh, The Lord shows us the the death of them uh, for uh, an example of what is going to happen to us spiritually if we walk in the wrong way and offer things to the Lord in the wrong way, with the wrong heart, for the wrong purposes. And we're going to see Eleazar later on as he takes over for Aaron. 
before they go into uh, Canaan, uh, that, that Eleazar then takes his place. And it tells us this in Second Timothy chapter 1, verse 9. He says, He has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given in Christ Jesus before the world began. So in that place, he gives us these things for, for our own good. So hold your place here uh, because there's a pattern that we're going to see, that there's things that are going to happen. We have an order and a pattern here that we, we want to take care of. And it, it's found in Hebrews, the book of Hebrews. So if you turn to Hebrews chapter 7, we see that in chapter 7, he gives us the order uh, of being the high priest. And then in chapter 9, we're going to see the pattern of it. Because everything that's here speaks to our relationship with the Lord. It speaks to us about what the Lord has for us. Uh, but there's an order and a pattern. All the things that were given out, remember, uh, the gold, the blue, uh, all those things that were in the, the work of the tabernacle and all those things that are going to be on the high priest's vestment, we see are, are just pictures of Jesus in one way or another. The gold speaking of deity, the blue of heavenly colors, uh, all these things just mixed in and intertwined in those places so that we can see Jesus. Because that was God's whole purpose, is to show us his glory, his way, and his righteousness as he goes through. And that we can have that, we can enter in. And in chapter 7 of Hebrews, uh, it says this, For this Melchizedek, and we remember Melchizedek from Genesis, even though it is a fairy tale, <laughs> uh, it's, it's truth. Melchizedek was there, he was king of Salem, he was the priest of the Most High God who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him. Before the Aaronic priesthood was set up, Melchizedek was there. God had sent him. And we're going to see why it was there, and we're going to see what it represents. And he says, To whom Abraham gave a tenth part of all, being first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. So he's king of righteousness, he's king of peace. He's king over all. (laughs) because <laughs> we're going to see that Jesus is uh, through this, that this is just a picture of Jesus to come. Now consider how great this man was, unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils, and verily they that are of the sons of Levi, who received the office of the priest of, of the priesthood, have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is, of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. And without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witnessed that he liveth. So the whole picture, remember Melchizedek, had no beginning, had no end, had no father, had no mother. Uh, he was from the beginning, he was to the end. They, they, they didn't know where he came from. All of these things were coming to pass just to be a picture of who Jesus was. And it was all for our blessing. He gives an order in, in these chapters of the things that need to go on. But the order to start with was Melchizedek. And he goes on in verse 11, and he says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, uh, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that there was another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron? So in this he's saying that there, the Aaronic priesthood was there, but there was one who was going to rise out of it that was after the order of Melchizedek, who was greater than the Aaronic priesthood. The priesthood was there for order. It was there as a picture of of stability and faithfulness and all these things. But there was one that was greater that was coming. And we know who it is. And thank you, Lord, that he came and that he died for us. In verse 12, he says, for the priesthood being changed, so there's going to be a change that's coming, and that change that we see is that it's going to be Jesus. And there is made of necessity a change also of the law. 
For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. Uh, they all came from the tribe of Levi, and we know that Jesus is coming from the tribe of Judah. It says in verse 14, For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah, of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning the priesthood, and it is yet far more evident, for after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest, who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Oh, the picture of Jesus, an endless life, and the power that he had. For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever, after the order of Melchizedek, from Psalm 110, if you remember that, uh, as it comes to pass in there. Uh, for there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and the unprofitableness thereof. There's a weakness in the law because it can't bring you to salvation. It can point you to truth. It can point you to the one who can bring life, but it can't save you. The law can't save us. And the Lord was going to show that. He already showed it through the priesthood of Aaron because uh there was no salvation there. There was just a, uh, an appeasement for the sin that they had, but there was no salvation. The salvation came by righteousness. It came by faith. And the law doesn't bring faith. The law just brings us to faith. <laughs> so thankful for that. Uh, and inasmuch, in verse 20, as, I, as not without an oath he was made priest, for those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him. There was an oath given, and it was an oath given by the Lord. And it says, The Lord swear and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. So it, it's already been prophesied that he was going to come. Psalm 110, certainly a long way before Jesus came. And yet the, the oath was given there by the Lord that there was going to come a priest who was going to stand forever at the throne of God. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. There's a better testament. There's a better covenant that was coming, and Jesus was the head of it. And God himself, God the Father, ordained it to be. And so we stand in that truth today. We look back and see the sureness of that and the truth of that, and we rejoice in that, and we realize Moses was there for a purpose. Aaron was there for a purpose, and they served a great purpose. But Jesus has a better purpose, and he has a better covenant for us. Uh, we're not under the law anymore. We're under grace, but we keep the law because of what grace has done. We don't disannul the law that God brought the law for a purpose to show us, and, and so we, we don't break it. Uh, we don't want to break it. We don't want to be in that place of, of going against it, but we realize the forgiveness that is in Christ because no man can keep the law. And so thank you, Lord, for bringing us Jesus. <laughs> and it says in verse 23, And they truly were many priests, because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. They all died. <clears throat> but our priest lives forever. Our high priest lives forever now. We don't have a priest that dies because the priest died because they were sinners. But our high priest came with no sin, but instead took our sin for us. And now we can rejoice in that and live eternally because of what Jesus has done. What a high priest we have. <laughs> but this man, because he continueth forever, forever hath an unchangeable priesthood. It's never going to change. He's always going to be the high priest. He's always going to be on the throne as the high priest. He's always going to be there. There is going to be no change. Every few years, the high priest had to change. Every few years, the priest would die, and they had to find another high priest, and, and another high priest, and another, until Jesus came. Even though it was prophesied, even though it was looked at in the Old Testament, that there was one that was going to come who, who was going to have that priesthood forever, we get to look back. They had to look forward and, and look to that. We, we get the answer. I'm glad, because <laughs> I wouldn't have figured it out. <laughs> I'm glad I already got the answer. Thank you, Lord, for giving us the answer, and the answer is Jesus. And he's that high priest that has come. And he says, for such a high priest became us who is holy, he's harmless, 
<laughs> he's undefiled, he's separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens, who needeth not daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sins and then for the sins of the people. This he did once when he offered up himself, once and for all, not to be offered up again. We just remember it in in our sacrament. We just remember what he's done. It's not that we sacrifice him over and over and over. He was sacrificed once and for all. He says, For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity, but the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. So there's the order of things. There's the order of how Jesus came, the order that he came after the order of Melchizedek. And now the pattern, if you switch over to chapter 9 of Hebrews, it says, Then verily the first covenant, which also, which, uh, excuse me, which had also ordinances of divine service, was a worldly sanctuary. So here's the pattern that was given back in the Old Testament, now come to fruition in the New Testament through Jesus. It's all about Jesus in every way. He says, For there was a tabernacle made, the first wherein was the candlestick, the table, the showbread, which is called the sanctuary, of which we know that Jesus was represented in each and every part. The table with the communion, the showbread on top of it, he being the the one who brought the manna every day and, and ordained these 12 tribes to be the tribes of Israel, the candlestick, the light of the world, the holy of holies with the mercy seat. All those things represent Jesus. We've seen those already. And it says, after the second veil, the tabernacle, which is called the holiest of all, uh, that holy place that the high priest would only go in once a year, that Jesus split that, that veil, it rented in two, and we are now able to enter in boldly before the throne of grace. Ugh. And he says, which had the golden censer and the Ark of the Covenant overlaid round about with gold, uh, wherein was the golden pot that had manna and Aaron's rod that budded in the tables of the covenant, uh, and over it the cherubims of glory shadowing the mercy the mercy seat of which we cannot now speak particularly. But when these things were thus ordained, the priest went always into the first tabernacle, accomplishing the service of God. Notice it was the service of God, not the service of the people, just, just like we've already talked about. The priests were there to minister to God. But into the second went the high priest alone once every year, not without blood, which he offered for himself, He had to offer it for himself because the priest was a sinner. It bothers me completely and horribly that we have priests in this world now who say that they are God himself, that their word that they speak is God and that they have no sin because all the priests that God made had to offer blood for themselves first and then for the people because they were sinners. There was only one perfect man and his name is Jesus. He was without sin, but he took our sin so that we wouldn't have to go through judgment. And it says in verse 8, the Holy Ghost is this signifying that the way into the holiest of all was not yet made manifest as the first tabernacle was yet standing, which was a figure of a time. It was a figure of what was to come. It was a type of. It was there. This is the pattern that's going on now. We saw the order. This is the pattern of things. And we see a difference because now we're able to enter into the holy place. We're able to enter in before God because of what Jesus has done for us. He says that which was a figure for the time then present in which were offered both gifts and sacrifices that could not make him that did uh, the service perfect as pertaining to the conscience which stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them until the time of the Reformation when Jesus came. They had to go through all the washings. Remember when we they entered into the tabernacle place, and we'll get pictures up on the, on the wall sometime soon here of, of those. But as they entered into the tabernacle, the brazen altar was there for sacrifice and then the labor for the washings and then they were able to go into the holy place and the altar of incense was there for the prayers of the saints to go up to God and the showbread and the candlestick and then they could finally go in 
Only once a year, though, after they offered a sacrifice for their own sin. And we know we're sinners, but Jesus was our sacrifice. And we don't have to go through all of that anymore because we could not keep it, the perfectness to go in. He says, be ye holy for I'm holy. And we look and go, oh God, I'm, I'm not holy. I'm not perfect. I've sinned. And I know you guys, you all got on the road this morning, so I know you all came in as sinners. Because <laughs> the world is crazy. It's awful out there. And we see the news and, and we see the things that are going on and we realize this world needs salvation. And then we realize Jesus is our salvation. And we have a privilege that most of the world does not know. Do you realize how privileged and how awesome a life you have because of what Jesus has done? You have a privilege to come in before God Almighty because of what Jesus has done. He took your place. He took my place. And now we get to enter in. And it doesn't matter the country that we're in. It doesn't matter the color of our skin. It it doesn't matter the culture that we came out of. It doesn't matter our political aspirations. It doesn't matter any of that. It cuts through all of that because Jesus is the only one that we look to. But it couldn't make the high priest perfect. All those things that he did, he sacrificed an animal. He washed his hands in the laver. He came into the holy of hope the holy place and saw the showbread and saw the candlestick and saw the altar of incense and prayed, but it couldn't make him perfect. But we're made perfect by the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. And that is amazing to me because we are imperfect people. We are flawed and he makes us flawless. Oh, thank you, Jesus. (laughs) And one day we're going to see that come to pass as we come before him in heaven around the throne. No wonder we're going to take the crowns off our head that he gives us and throw them at his feet because we know that we didn't earn them. We, di- we didn't merit them. It was only by, by his sacrifice that, that we're able to enter into that place. And I think it's going to make us even more thankful of what he's done because we're going to see all these heavenly colors. We're going to see all these heavenly things that we can only think about now and and make pictures of and and out of our own mind. And even our minds aren't capable of picturing all that God has for us. But even as we think about them now, we realize it's going to be awesome there. We just don't know how awesome until we get there. (laughs) As we take those crowns and throw them at his feet, we are nothing compared to what Jesus is. But he makes us everything. (sighs) It says in verse 10, they stood only in meats and drinks and diverse washings and carnal ordinances imposed on them till the time. But Christ, but Christ, weighed and retreat, did all the, not all the buts, but he did 15 or 16, but God in scripture. And it was, it was awesome as we came to it just to realize what Christ has done. And here's one of them, but Christ being come a high priest, but Christ become a high priest he's the one that became the high priest and this is the real high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle not made with hands that is to say not of this building christ did it neither by the blood of goats and calves but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place having obtained a, a eternal redemption for us he's got it and it's done. Look at that word obtained. It's past tense. He already obtained it. It's done. It's finished. The work is complete. We just get to read about it now and think about it and apply it to our own hearts and minds. This is the position that we stand in, that we're righteous and holy because of what Christ has done. And as righteous and holy people in this world, our lights should be shining bright and showing people the way to go. That is why it's so important for us to represent Jesus well. Not to just stay in the place that we were, sinners saved by grace and just laying on the couch going, okay, I'm just waiting for you to come, Lord. (laughs) But out in the world being lights in this world because this world is getting darker. We've got people killing each other, not just Hamas killing Israel and Israel killing Hamas. We've got people on our own streets that are killing each other (coughs) over possessions, over toys, over games. I remember last year just reading about somebody at Thanksgiving 
uh, th- that killed somebody in the household because they had a fight because they thought they took too much food. Aren't you waiting for Thanksgiving to have somebody like that come to your house for Thanksgiving dinner, huh? <laughs> Make sure they get first choice, you know? <laughs> just, Lord. But that's where the heart goes without Christ. And you and I are new creatures. We're new creations in Christ. Lord, help me to represent you well as I go out into this world, out into this mission field, out into my own places, and make sure that I have my heart settled with you about who I am in you so that I can go out rightly. I don't want to go out and represent him in a wrong way. I want to represent him for who he is, and this is, he's telling us who he is. We don't have to add to it. We don't have to take away from it. This is who he is. He came to replace the old with the new. It wasn't that the old was bad. It just never brought us to the right place. But this brings us to a right place. God knew all along he was going to do this. People wanted a law, so the Lord gave them a law. But he knew it wasn't going to set settle he knew it wasn't going to be able to bring them to a place of of coming to salvation he just knew that they were going to try and keep laws and never be able to do it that's why there's signs up on the road stop and we were on our way to church this morning (laughs) red light in front of us guy goes through it got to the next light Somebody else got it. <laughs> well, let's see. We broke two laws and we only had two lights so far. <laughs> Amazing. But that's what we want to do. We want to break every law to see how far we can get. And that's man's heart. And we shouldn't be surprised by it. That's natural man. But we're different. We're a peculiar people. But we're also a kingdom of kings and priests. Oh, thank you, Lord. And it wasn't because we earned it. It wasn't because we've been in church enough. Now now we've got a title of king and priest. It's because of the blood of Jesus Christ on the cross, which is why we, we, we take it, to remember what he's done for us. But we've got to settle that in our hearts. Lord, you're the high priest, and I stand with you. Mm. And there's a lot of things that we stand with, and a lot of things that we cheer for, and a lot of things that we aspire to. But the greatest thing, the better thing, because remember, Hebrews is a chapter of better things and more perfect. Better, I think, 13 times in the book of Hebrews, more perfect or eternal, nine times. What should we be in that place of being more perfect than what the law can present? Because our high priest accomplished all of it, and we're in him. The Lord, let me be more like you. We're these image bearers that need to be more like Jesus. (laughs) And he finishes up this section here uh, in verse uh, 14. It says, How much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, no sin, no blemish, and purge your conscience from dead works. Lord, purge our consciences. Purge us not to think like the world does or like our past does, because the enemy keeps bringing up our past, doesn't he? I don't know about you, but there's times that I sit there and and my past comes right up before my eyes and into my mind, and I remember those things. And he says, you call yourself a Christian and you've done those things? And my answer is always the same. Yes, that was me, but now Jesus Christ, but God, who is rich in mercy, has freed me from all of that. Not because of what I've done, but because of what he's done. So purge your consciences from dead works to serve the living God. Notice here it says the same thing that we saw in chapter 28 of Exodus. Who are we serving? Not the people, but the living God. Our God is alive. <laughs> and thank you, Lord, the world's gods are dead. That's why they carry them around. Because they can't walk. They have eyes, but they can't see. They have ears, but they can't hear. And they have to carry them because they can't move. <laughs> We get a God that carries us. Oh, thank you, Lord. <laughs> and, and for this cause, in verse 15, he is the mediator of the New Testament. He's the one that brings the New Testament. That by means of death for the redemption of the transgressions that were under the First Testament, they which are called might receive the promise of eternal inheritance. That's our promise. That's what we get eternal inheritance we're eternal beings and we have an inheritance from god thank you lord 
Because all the inheritance that the world can give you isn't going to last. It's going to burn. It's going to go away. But the inheritance that we have is eternal in the heavens. And that's where we're going when we die and go to be with him or he raptures us off this earth. Either way, we're going home. And thank you, Lord, for that. So back in, in Exodus here, uh, as we see the, the order and then the pattern, we see that there's great things that are going on, uh, and we don't have much time left, so for sure we're not going to get through this chapter. Uh, this is a long chapter, but, but it's good. Uh, and it says in verse 4, uh, And they are the garments which they shall make, and these are the garments that they shall make, a breastplate, an ephod, a robe, an embroidered coat, and a mitre, and a girdle, and they shall make holy garments for Aaron thy brother and his sons, that they may minister again unto me in the priest's office. Third time in four verses. <laughs> They're going to minister to me. And Lord, am I ministering to you, or am I ministering for my own needs, for my own wants, so that people can see how holy I am? <laughs> oh, and the world sees right through that, don't they? They see holy people that walk around and they don't want to be a Christian because they see the holy people who aren't really holy. But we don't represent that. We represent a, a, a living God who is holy. We're made in the image of him. And so we, aren't you glad that Jesus didn't come and just say, well, I've provided a sacrifice for you that will get you halfway to heaven. you got to work out the rest. Aren't you glad that we don't get a quarter of it? or half of it, or three quarters, we get to go all the way. That's what his sacrifice did. It it made it complete and full and rich, and that we don't have to worry about how to make up for the half. Lord, how do I get there? By the blood of Jesus. It's done. It's complete. Thank you, Lord, for it. (laughs) Ah, It's all his work. So these are the garments that he's going to have, and we'll just go through the first part here. Uh, for time's sake, and they shall take gold and, and uh, blue and purple and scarlet and fine linen. And we've seen those, the deity, the heavenly colors, the royalty, the blood covering, the righteousness of the Lord, all those things represented there in verse 5 uh, that are going to be put on Aaron. <laughs> Isn't it amazing? They, they say in America, in the world, that clothes make the man, right? That's why you need an Armani suit or one that costs 600 bucks. <laughs> I don't need an Armani suit. I got a robe of righteousness, and you can't count the cost of that. Oh. <laughs> but all those things they're going to be put on, they're going to put them on him, but it didn't make him righteous. It was the blood covering that did it, for without the shedding of blood, there is no remission of sin. He had sin, but it was covered in the blood. And we have sin, but it's covered in the blood of our Jesus And they shall make an ephod of gold, of blue, of purple, of scarlet, fine twined linen with cunning work. And it shall have two shoulder pieces that are joined at the two edges thereof, so it shall be joined together. And the curious girdle of the ephod, which is the pounded or the sash that would hold it together, it shall be of the same according to the work thereof, even of gold, of blue, of purple, of scarlet, and fine twined linen. And you shall take two onyx stones, engrave on them the names of the children of Israel, six of their names on the one stone, and the other six names of the rest on the other stone, according to their birth, with the work of an engraver in stone, like the engravings of a signet, shalt thou engrave the the two stones with the names of the children of Israel, and thou shalt make them to be set in the ouches or the settings of gold, and, and you shall put... Uh, the, the two stones upon the shoulders of the ephod for stones of memorial unto the children of Israel. And Aaron shall bear their names before the Lord upon his two shoulders for a memorial. And you shall make ouches or settings of gold. And the two chains of pure gold at the ends of wreathen work shalt thou make them. And fasten the wreathen chains to the ouches or the settings. So we have this picture of the 12 tribes of Israel, six of their names written on one stone, six on the other. And where are they on the, on the high priest? On his shoulders. He's going to carry their names in before the Lord. And it tells us in Isaiah that, that our names are graven on Jesus' hands. Mm. And he's going to carry us where? To our God. He's going to carry us to our Father in heaven. And he wants to bear our burdens. And we all have burdens. 
He said, my burden is easy. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. I want to carry you before my Lord because you can't get there on your own. And he carries us. That is just so sweet. And and the older I get, I find the less that I can carry. (laughs) You know, we all have those great dreams when we get married. You know, we're going to sweep our bride off her feet and, and carry her in. If I tried picking her up now, we'd both be on the floor. <laughs> and we'd probably break every bone in our bodies. <laughs> but he carries us without falling because he's never fallen. He's never faltered. And he never will. His strength remains forever. He's able to carry you. And we know the burdens that we have. And yet he's able to bear each and every one of those without falling. Aren't you glad we have a God who can carry us and keep us and sustain us in this life? And he doesn't get old so that he can't carry us anymore. He's not too young that he can't carry us. And none of us are at that place where he can't pick us up. Carries the weight of the whole world, the sin of the whole world he carried. If he can carry that, he can carry you and I. And thank you, Lord, for it. So great, so gracious. Father, as we come before you and just prepare our hearts to take communion, we just look at this, Lord, and our minds are blown. We, we, just, we just don't have a clue. Uh, we, we try and put it together. We try and look at it, and we realize that there's a lot of things going on and a lot of things happening, and uh, yet you, you've uh, accomplished them all uh, in what you've done. It isn't that... Uh, We have to accomplish anything. You did it all for us. And so we just thank you, Lord. And Father, as you carry us, you know the burdens that we have right now. And and we just want to lay them at your feet, knowing that you're able to take them from us, Lord. That you see us sitting in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. The work is already accomplished. That's why Jesus said on the cross, it is finished. The work has been accomplished. The work has been taken care of. We get to rest now in what you've done. And so, Lord, help us not to strive with these things or or to be anxious about these things, but just to rest in you and let you take us from glory to glory, from faith to faith, from trust to trust. Lord, that we would just look to you. But, Father, help us to be those good witnesses in the world. We know that you haven't done all this just so that we can lay down and do nothing. You've done these things so that we can be a kingdom of kings and priests accomplishing your work here in this world. Help us to do that, Lord. We know that we get to rest once we come home. But, Father, until then, uh, may help us to occupy with the things that you've given us till you come. But help us to trust you as we go through those days and those times, Lord. We can't do it, but you did. So we trust you this morning and we give you thanks and we just prepare our hearts, Lord, before you. So speak to our hearts, minister to us about what you have for us this morning, and and just speak to our lives about your finished work that we wouldn't strive in it, but to trust you in it, Lord. We love you and we thank you and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.
Father, we just come this morning just thanking you for all that you've done, Lord, as we uh, see more and more of the pattern, the order of things that you have and how you've uh, brought them to pass, Lord. Uh, Not just to uh, read about them, but just to see uh, the transition as you brought it. It is just so amazing, Lord, that there, there is nothing that we've added to it that we can take away from it. It was all your work, and it was all your plan, and you've accomplished it. And we just thank you for it this morning, Lord, that we can rest in you, that we can trust you, and, Father, that nothing in this world can pluck us out of your hand. Uh, We're just so grateful, Lord, as we sit this morning just resting in you and trusting you. Uh, We just thank you, Father. We rejoice in who you are. We give you thanks for all that you've done because you're the only one that's worthy of all of our praise not just part of it but all of it lord our worship and praise is not divided between different saviors between different gods there's only one and we just thank you lord that we can trust you with everything that goes on have your way with our hearts lord and and just bring us to the place of being settled in you and trusting you lord and we just give you thanks and worship you in jesus name amen let's partake 